Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Braddock Street Church, where we strive to be followers of Jesus, loving God in worship, loving others in small groups, and serving the world in mission. My name is Annalise. I'm one of the pastors here at Braddock Street. I'm so glad that you all are with us here this morning. A couple of things for you to know as we get started. Um, if you have prayer requests to send to us, you can see our screens for how you can send those in to us. And if you're online with us this morning, first of all, good morning, good to see you, glad you're here. Um, and if you have a prayer request to send to us, you can put it right in the Facebook comment section. There will also be a digital sign-in card in the comment section so that if you are new to us and you're online, you can fill that out and let us get to know you a little bit better. And if you're here in the room and you're new to us, please take a second, fill out one of those green cards that is in the pew in front of you, leave that in our offering plate um, so that we can get to know you a little bit better as well. And we will continue now together in worship with Better Is One Day. Yeah. 
please be seated as we invite Jan forward for our morning scripture. The scripture this morning is from Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, a childhood friend of Herod the ruler, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues, and they had John also to assist them. The word of God for the people of God. Hello, my friends. How are you all? Good? You good? Yeah? How many folks got to go to VBS this week? Last week? Yeah? I'm so glad. It was awesome to see you guys there. We had so much fun. It was a lot of fun. So today, we are going to be talking about that piece of scripture that was just read beautifully for us. And one of the coolest things about that scripture is that it talks about how we are able to spread God's love around the entire world. Sometimes it's kind of hard for us to think about just how big that is. So I went up to a confirmation classroom this morning, and I promise, Mr. Jed, I will put this back. I stole this map from up there of the whole world, which is just really big, right? And it's kind of cool, if you look really closely at this map, it'll be hard for everybody out there to see it, but you guys might be able to see. There are little stickers on this map, and every one of those stickers is somewhere that folks from this congregation have been on mission, have been sharing God's love by doing good work, by loving people and getting to know people that are super different from us, and that is so cool, isn't it? I think that's really neat. So this world is huge, but even just one little church like ours can visit people and meet people and tell them about God's love and learn from them about God's love all around the entire world, which is really cool. And it starts right here with us, which I think is awesome. So even we, Braddock Street, can touch lives all over the world through God's love, and our hearts will get changed by that too. All right, will you all please pray with me? Holy God, this morning as we look at this map of the entire world, we are so thankful for every life that is in it. And we are thankful for all the lives here at Braddock Street and for how we can share your love to people all over your world. We love you. Amen. Thank you, friends. You can return back to your seats. It is important to us here at Braddock Street that you all know where it is that your generosity goes and how we are able to bless our community through the ways that we um, can give here. And so we want to raise up for you Habitat for Humanity, which is an amazing organization that helps provide good, affordable housing, good, safe, affordable housing for folks who would otherwise struggle to be able to be in a home like this. Um, we are able to support them financially. We also are able to send teams to go help them out sometimes, which we are really excited about as well. So thank you all for being the kind of congregation um, that cares so much about your neighbors and being sure that everyone can get a safe and affordable home. Um, we are so thankful for all of your generosity, and we are going to invite our ushers to come forward as we take up this morning's offering and enjoy together this offering song.
Well, good morning. My name is Kirk Nave. I'm one of the pastors here at Braddock Street Church. And uh, today we are concluding our series called New Church, looking at the book of Acts as we rethink church in a post-pandemic era. We started with the day of Pentecost, focusing on how all the power in all that we do comes from God. The next week we talked about the essential piece of our spiritual life that is the community of faith. We need one another. And in this new era, we need a new commitment as we looked at the life and especially the death of Stephen, the first person to die for the cause of Christ. We looked at how our church must serve our community, and today we focus on reclaiming the church's central mission. Let us join together in prayer. Holy God, you love us so. Your love for us means everything. Today, help us to reclaim our mission, our purpose of sharing that love with our neighbors. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So last week, one of us in the congregation asked me as as he was leaving, so exactly talking about this new church, what are we saying that we haven't said before? And I said, nothing. It's just important for us in a new era to reclaim the things that we already know and perhaps have forgotten or they're not foremost in our minds because with all that we do in church, sometimes it's very easy to lose focus. To illustrate this, uh, a number of years ago in another congregation, I was on a mission team that went to refurbish homes in Franklin, Virginia. Uh, Some of you may remember that flood took out the whole town. They had bumper stickers, Franklin, you can't drown a great town. Um, And a number of United Methodist teams, along with many, many others, went into Franklin to refurbish homes. The, The house that my team was assigned to was, you know, it already been gutted by a previous team. You know, they take out all the flooring. They had to take out all the drywall, all the insulation. If you just put back drywall over top of that, of course, it just gets moldy and it's unhealthy for the family. So we were starting from scratch pretty much and we had a ringer on our team. We had a professional contractor who was also really good with volunteers, which was a great blessing for me. Um, We walked into that house and he looked at the exterior walls. You know, we could see him from the inside because everything had been ripped out of it. And you could see there had been a fire. You could see that the house was probably built in the 1930s or 40s They had um, spliced the floor joints because the fire had evidently taken some of them out, you know. And the contractor walks in and he looks around and he says, okay, do we put this back like it was or do we have it meet code? Those are two entirely different propositions. Um, In other words, there was a lot of things, you know, that were grandfathered in from the 1930s and 40s that if you're building a new house, uh, you really should do it in a different way than was done many, many years ago. And I like that idea for the sake of church. As we're coming out of the pandemic, do we put things back like they were? A lot of us, that's, that's what we long for. That's what we hunger for. We want the church to be like it used to be. Or are there some things we need to look at in fresh ways to do things differently than we did because they fit better in a new era? It's hard for us to think that way because there's so much invested in the past. Um, About 150 years ago, Methodists in America had the goal of planting a new congregation in the United States every day. For the most part, we were doing it. And about the turn of the 20th century, a little over 100 years ago, there were more Methodist Christians in America than any other kind of Christian. And we kind of went beyond just doing church and began building new things institution-wise. We built colleges and universities. You would be surprised at some of the universities, say Syracuse and the University of Southern California, that were originally started by Methodists, you know, and no longer really have that relationship. We built hospitals. We built uh, low-income housing. We built foster homes, retirement homes. The Board of Church and Society of the United Methodist Church bought a piece of property in Washington, D.C. that says volumes. It sits on a corner, and if you look right out the front door, you see the United States Capitol. If you turn to your left, you see the United States Supreme Court. Those are the neighbors. In other words, Methodists were so numerous in the United States that they had 
the numbers and the power and the vision to say, we want to help form this country along Christian values. That piece of property is still there, by the way, and that's still where the Board of Churches and Society is. And yet, with all the institution building, around the 1950s, a number of people, sociologists and other ones, you just, actually, you just looked at the street, right? And you began to see the demise of Christianity. And it wasn't just Methodists, it was all Christians. Here's, here's how it's gone just in the last 15 years, from 2007. This actually only goes up to 2019, so the pandemic is not a part of this. And the top two lines, first one up top is the number of people who would call themselves Protestant Christians. The next highest line is the number of people that would call themselves Catholic Christians. The two lines that are kind of growing from the bottom are the number of people who would say they are nothing in particular or they are agnostic. So that's Christianity in the United States over the last 15 years, excluding what was happening with the pandemic. So just think for a minute, if that's the way we were doing things, and things were already on a downhill trend since the 1950s, if we continue to do things the way we've done them, right, put things back like they were, should we expect any different results? And by the way, here's what uh, Braddock Street, uh, our membership, has looked like over that same period. If you would forget that sharp decline in that one year, there was a, there was a year where they cleaned the rolls, so that doesn't really reflect. But since that time, you know, we kind of have been beating the curve a little bit, but we're not, you know, we're not knocking the doors out with, this, with our approach. And then if you look at the people who come to worship, here's another graph. This, these statistics, by the way, are from the Pew Research Center. Um, the blue line is the people who are already, say, members, who would call themselves religious, who uh, say they attend worship of some kind of religious service. These people in the blue line are those that attend once a month or more, okay? So they went from 54 to 45%. In other words, the people who are members don't come as often as they used to, okay? The gold line is the number of people who say they attend worship, but only once or twice a year, okay? So that has gone from 45% to 54%. In other words, they flip-flop, they traded places. There are more people now attending once or twice a year and less and less people who attend once a month. Again, this is from the Pew Research Center. If you Google that, you'll, you'll probably find it. Here's what our, our worship attendance in, at Braddock Street has looked like over the same period of time. Again, we've kind of beaten the, you know, gone against the trend. We've seen slight increase, but we're not knocking the doors out. We're not, not knocking it out of the park. We're, that, that trend of the whole country is affecting us as well. So what do we know? First off, consumer church is no longer a viable approach to being a Christian. And what do I mean by consumer church? That means, okay, if the music, if the praise band plays well, if the preacher pr brings a good message, you know, then I'll participate. I will attend and I will probably give my money, okay? I'll participate. Or if the church provides what my family needs with, with children's ministries, youth ministries, and somebody, you know, as long as the church gives me what I want, I will support it. That is what you might think of as consumer church. Remember last week when I used the phrase, somebody should? You know, when you catch yourself saying, somebody should take care of this. You see the disconnect? It's not, I'm a disciple of Jesus, and this is my church, and it depends on my participation, or things don't get done, right? We don't do ministry together. And in that consumer church model, evangelism is reduced to as long as the staff does things right and as long as Sunday worship is good, then people will just show up in our church. You see the disconnect? There is a mission of making disciples. That's why we're here. To invite other people to understand this relationship with Jesus Christ, this, this incredible love that God has for us. If it means the world to us, don't we want to share that with somebody else? The idea is we're here to make disciples and more faithful disciples. So let's recap in the book of Acts where we've seen the gospel up to what we read today, up to chapter 13, where we've seen the gospel go. We start all the way back in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. 
But you will receive power, this is Jesus talking to his disciples, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Again, the power is from God, the Holy Spirit. They will go in their own neighborhood, Jerusalem and Judea. They will go to Samaria, people that their mama told them to stay away from, and even to the ends of the earth. In chapter 8, Philip talks to an Ethiopian official who obviously then takes the gospel to Ethiopia. We see Peter in Acts 9 and 10 taking the gospel to Lydda, which is west of Jerusalem and all the way to the coast in Joppa. Also in chapter 10, he baptizes Cornelius, who is a Roman centurion of all things, a Gentile, not even a God-fearer when he starts his journey. So the, the apostles are sent throughout the world. And also notice what God's up to with crisis. And for me, this is good news when we think about coming out of a pandemic and thinking about how that might have affected our church. Look at this verse, these verses in Acts 11, 19 and 21, and then 25. Now, those who were scattered because of the persecution that took place over Stephen, right? Christians are running away from Jerusalem. They traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, and they spoke the word to no one except Jews. But among them were some men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who, on coming to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists also proclaiming the Lord Jesus. The hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number became believers and turned to the Lord. And it was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. So when there's persecution, when there's crisis, sometimes these people just have to scatter for fear of being killed. And God uses that to take the good news to other countries brought it to Antioch, which is the setting of the scripture that we read this morning. Antioch is the third largest city in all the Roman Empire. You see Christians fleeing from persecution who start a church there. Um, You see the first Gentiles being accepted into the Christian faith. Those are non-Jews, by the way. Jews were told not to have any contact with Gentiles, and even they become a part of the church in Antioch. And of course, as it said, this is where the disciples are first called Christians. So Antioch is a very important church. And then from Antioch, they send others. Let's look at this. Acts 13, what we read this morning. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, God's nudge, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Barnabas and Saul. Here's a map of where they went to first. Um, The little gold button on your right is Antioch, north of Israel. And then they go first to Cyprus, and then they make a loop back through Asia Minor, which today we would call Turkey. This is, remember, this isn't a time that's safe for travel. You get in a boat on the Mediterranean Sea, you literally take your life in your hands. No life preservers. The sides of the boats are typically rather low. If a storm comes up, you're in big trouble. And they did that because of the, of the cause of Christ. They risked their lives. And among them, the people alongside of Saul, who we know later as Paul, is this guy named Barnabas. The very name means son of encouragement, right? Somebody you want with you when you're doing risky business. Somebody to encourage you, support you, maybe even be a mentor to you. And look at where he is from. We go back to Acts chapter 4. There was a Levite from Cyprus, Joseph, whom whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that belonged to him, then brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. When you go back and you look at the early formation of the Christian church, there were a number of people who sold what they had and gave it to the ministry of the church. Barnabas was one of those. And he's from Cyprus, a priest from Cyprus. He already knows many of the believers in Cyprus, which is the first place Paul and Barnabas are to go. There's an important lesson for each one of us that we begin when we want to share our faith in Jesus Christ, we begin with people we already have relationships with. That's essential because the idea of evangelism where we take, you know, this good news of Jesus Christ to perfect strangers doesn't work for most people. Oh, by the way, because I brought this up, I just want to give you an idea how far Paul went That's all four of his journeys, his missionary journeys. He goes back to Cyprus. He goes as far as Rome, where he eventually is killed for the faith. He's been, obviously, through Greece and all of Asia Minor. He travels everywhere. 
But back to how they share the faith, they would typically start in a synagogue, people who were on the same page. It's really hard to share faith with somebody that you don't know. Annalise and I did a, uh, an evangelism training called Coffee Shop Evangelism. Um, the primary leader of the workshop was called, uh, is a guy by the name of Scott Crosstech. I had heard from Scott before. He planted a church in downtown Kansas City um, to give you an idea of the building that they eventually got. You know, downtown ministry is different than suburban ministry. On one side, there's a tattoo parlor. On the other side is a bar, and their backdoor neighbor is a strip club. That's where they started their church, and they have built relationships. They deliver cookies twice a year to the strip club, by the way, just to show they're good neighbors, and they just love people for who they are, even if they disagree with what they're up to, right? Scott, when he started the church, he, he shared his story of, of starting it. He said he would put 35 pennies in one pocket, and he would start going to the coffee shops. Now, this is going to give the heebie-jeebies to any introvert in the room. He put 35 pennies in his pocket, and he would intentionally start conversations with strangers. He said, most of the time, it was when I'm standing in line waiting, you know, to get coffee, to place my order, and I would say to the person in front of me, "Um, so what kind of coffee do you like? Or have you been here before? Can you recommend a coffee for me? You know, people that love coffee will love to talk about coffee. He also said in Kansas City, the weather changes every 15 minutes, and people in Kansas City love to talk about the weather, all right? He talked to the person in front of him. He talked to the person behind him if he had time. He would try and get their name. And if the conversation was going well, he always had a business card, you know, Scott Crosstech starting a new congregation here in downtown Kansas City, you know. Now, I know he would take 35 pennies in one pocket. Every time he met somebody new and got their name, he would take a penny out and put it in the other pocket because he was going to get 35 new names, hand out 35 business cards every single day. That would drive me crazy. I I wouldn't know how to do that. Because for most people, if you're going to encourage them to take a new direction in their faith journey or talk about, you know, fundamental beliefs, who is God and who does God call me to be and what kind of person am I supposed to be, how am I supposed to live in this world, you're not going to take that news from strangers, right? It's going to be somebody you already know, somebody you love, somebody you know who loves you, somebody you can trust. So for most of us, we start with friends, relatives, associates, fellow classmates, youth and children. I want you to hear this. Youth and children, your friends are more likely to take a new turn to follow Jesus than adults will. Because we adults think we've got the world figured out, and we think we've already figured out how to live with or without God in our life, okay? So do not sell yourself short when it comes time to the opportunity to share what you think is good about God. I found that probably my most fruitful place in meeting people and inviting them to a church that I served was when I coached soccer. And because one of my kids was probably on the team and I was coaching soccer and after practice or after a game, parents would have conversations with me. I would not tell them initially what I did for a living. Okay? And when they heard, they would say, so what do you do for a living? I'm a pastor, and you got one of two reactions. One is, you know, run away, run away. Um, <clears throat> I, it was more polite than that. Like, you know, oh, well, that's, that's nice. Or very often the conversation went like, well, we just moved to the community, and we've been looking for a church, you know, but we haven't found one yet. And it was just the easiest thing in the world to say, Oh, well, why don't you try us? I, I love the people in my congregation. See, didn't, wasn't going to talk about me or, or, you know, how we serve you. But no, the relationships. These are wonderful people. It, you, you'd love getting to know some of these folks. And you can do the same kind of thing. You may not have the same opportunity because you're not a pastor, so the conversation doesn't immediately go there. But there will be moments There'll be moments with friends and classmates. I remember being 13 years old and a friend of mine having a really hard time with his mom. He was just just 13, just like I was, and I got it, right? Just irritable. Life wasn't good right now. And I was able to simply say to him, hey, you want to come to Sunday school with me? See, those are the places. It may not be worship that people can be invited to. It can be your small group, youth, invite your friends to blast. Invite your friends to a mission effort, you know? Adults, 
if you're involved in our backpack ministry and you're putting food away for hungry kids here in Winchester and Frederick County, you pro- your neighbor probably also has a heart for hungry kids in our community. Why not invite them to come alongside of you? Number one, puts down your workload, right? <laughs> Eases your workload. But secondly, it invites people to a space where they learn, oh, Christians don't have horns, you know? They're not always like those people I see on TV who are on this issue and protesting this and bad-mouthing so-and-so and and judging so-and-so. No, we're here to love people. Come join us alongside. I will probably, in all my ministry, never forget the day I got a phone call from somebody in this congregation who wanted to ask my permission to invite somebody who was not a member of our church to participate in one of our mission efforts. And I thought, oh my God goodness of course you invite people to join us on a mission effort anything invite them to be in the praise band or the choir your sunday school class your anything that you're engaged in if you know somebody for whom you think they're in the right space and it's a natural conversation just up and invite because that's the mission people no longer just walk into a church because they feel like that's the thing they do That's not crossing their mind on the Sunday morning. It's a new era, and we need to reclaim the mission of making disciples of Jesus Christ. If not, if we go back to doing things the way we did them before, what might you expect? It's our task together, and it, it should be a fun ride. Let us pray. Holy God, you love us so. You love us so much, you give us your Son, Jesus Christ, who has given his life for us. What incredible love you have for us. Can you help us to share that same love with our neighbor? And God, this morning we thank you for this food for the journey that we call Holy Communion. We know that we are not worthy to come and to receive, so right now we offer silent prayers confessing our sins to you. God, we thank you that your love is all about forgiveness and giving us hope and new life. And we remember that you so loved the world that you gave your only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In the name of Jesus Christ, thank you, God, for our forgiveness. And now, lift up your hearts and give thanks to God for all that God has given to each one of us, starting first throughout history, calling a unique people in all the world, a nation called Israel, to show the world what it's like to live with God. And They didn't get it right any more than you and I did. And in the fullness of time, God sent His Son, Jesus Christ. And on the night before His sacrifice for us, He took bread, gave thanks to you, God, broke the bread and gave it to His disciples that night and gives it to His disciples today, saying, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples then and today, saying, this is the covenant, a new covenant in my blood, given for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. And so as we remember what you have done for us in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice. Almighty God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here in this room and upon these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ returns and we feast at his heavenly banquet. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you now to join with me in the prayer that our Lord Jesus has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to ask those that are going to assist us to come forward at this time. And as they do that, I would remind each one of us that uh, this is Christ's table. So anyone who wants to lead a new life in Jesus Christ, you are welcome and invited to his table. Uh, We will have three stations for communion, one in front of each major section of the sanctuary. So you will come, you'll be presented with a piece of already cut up bread, and you'll have the opportunity to take an individual cup of grape juice. Um, As you do that, please put your cup back into the tray as you return to your seat. If you need gluten-free elements, they're here at this small table by the baptismal font in prepackaged containers. We'll ask this side to come by the outside aisle. For the center section, if you'll come by this aisle to my right, including those of you, please go across the center aisle and come this way. If this section will simply come and return by the outer aisle. Come as you feel led.
Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we feel your love in this room. You have accepted us and cleansed us of our sin. And now you lay hands on us to send us forth into this world to share this great love with our neighbors. Let us rise from this table, fed by this sacrament, empowered by your Holy Spirit to change the world one heart at a time. We thank you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Now I invite you to stand as you are able as we sing together, Holy is the Lord. Thank you for coming to worship to get today online as well as here and in person. As we go, a couple of things. First, thanks to each one of you who helped put together Vacation Bible School. It's a great success for all the kids. Just thank you, thank you, thank you. 
If you missed out and you'd like another place to serve, the 535 Club, our ESL, Hispanic Latinx ministry, uh, is going to continue during the month of July, and we'll get kicked up in the fall, of course. If you'd like to be a part of that every Wednesday night at 535, um, we'd love to hear from you. Contact Annalise or myself or just call the church office. We'll get you all lined up. But now know how much God loves you and what that means to your life. Take that great good news and all your excitement and share that with somebody you care about. It might just change their life. Go with the blessing of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed week, Braddock Street.